Now we'll go to our second inductee, Pete Wurzberger. And before I talk a little bit about Pete, uh, I want to introduce several family members. Um, of course, uh, Pete died last year and uh, after several years of failing health, but was still very much involved in the field to the degree that he could be. And his daughter, Christy, will be receiving his plaque in just a little while. But three other family members uh, took the time out of their busy schedules to come and be with us in Louisville. And I want to just uh, briefly introduce them and uh, tell you who they are. We have with us um, Pete's son, Terry Wurzberger. And would you just please stand up? Um, <laughs> Mm -hmm. And his his niece Debbie Bounds. Okay. And his uh, granddaughter um, Mary Ro Rosalind. Okay. <laughs> and thank you to Terry and Debbie and Mary for being with us as well. Um, our second inductee, then, of course, is Pete, and he was truly an innovator. He was willing to do things a different way and to try something new if he believed it could benefit people. Although I didn't know Pete personally, I often heard his name in professional contexts, and I had the impression that he was born sometime in the mid-1800s, and I think it was just because of the scope and extent of his work. In reality, Pete continued to be very active in the field, as I mentioned, as much as possible until uh, just before his death. He was born in Sibley, Illinois in 1924, and he served in World War II as a torpedo's mate second class. After that, he received a degree in corrective physical therapy from the University of Illinois, and while working in that capacity at Heinz Veterans Center, you guessed it, he became one of the very first orientation and mobility specialists. He worked first with adults and then with children in the public schools, advocating for changes that were often not popular, but later became common practice. And you know that people who have that quality, who can sway the way that their peers think, certainly have commanded the respect and admiration of their peers. So the fact that Pete had the strength to change commonly accepted practices says a great deal for his character. is Christy Wurzberger, and Burdell Wurzberger, who everybody knew as Pete Wurzberger, was my father. With me tonight is my brother Terry from San Jose, my niece Mary Rosellen from Truckee, California, and my cousin Deborah Bounds from Carrier, Mississippi. My oldest brother Steve, Mary's father, couldn't be with us tonight because of health issues. While you all know we lost my father last year, you may not know that we also lost my mother five months earlier. Their close passing has been difficult on my family, but at the same time, it seems oddly appropriate since they'd known each other for over 70 years, married 66 of those years, that they went so close together. Those last six months of, after my mother passed away were very hard for my father. In addition to being a good father, he loved his wife deeply. Like tonight, I am so very glad that we could be there for him, for both of them, when it mattered the most. We are honored to be present at this event, and we are incredibly proud that you have honored my father by inducting him into the American Printing House Hall of Leaders and Legends in the Blindness Field. About 15 years ago, I was at a cocktail party, and was introduced to a woman who subsequently asked me what I did for a living. I, after telling her about myself, I asked her what she did. She told me she worked for the Contra Costa County Schools, and then I asked her if she was a teacher. She said she worked in special education. Specifically, she worked with blind and visually impaired students. At that, at that point, I said, oh, my father used to work in orientation mobility. She said, really, what's your father's name? I said, my father's Pete Wurzberger. She looked at me, she said, Pete Wurzberger is your father? <laughs> and I said, um, yes. She said, oh my God, your father is a legend. 
Looking back now, perhaps that conversation was a sign of things to come. I can't tell you much about what he did during his working life. I can only really share with you what I know about him as my father. When I grew up, I don't ever recall my father ever complaining about his job, unlike a lot of my friends. During the early 60s, I have vague memories of going with him on several occasions, probably on a Saturday when my mother was working, she was a nurse, so he could work one-on-one -on -one with some of his students who attended Oakland and Berkeley high schools. I recall he spent many evenings at times making relief type maps of various streets and specific areas of San Francisco in an attempt to assist his student teachers in understanding what their students would see with their fingers. I remember folding flyers, stuffing envelopes, and licking stamps, what seemed like thousands but was probably really only hundreds of envelopes when my father worked on the board of the AAWB. After my father passed away, we received dozens and dozens of letters from family, friends, and former students. Many of his students shared stories of my father and spoke not just of what an incredible teacher and mentor he was to them, but of his ability to find the right fit when recommending student teaching positions or available job prospects. Among others, I also heard stories about my father lending students money or if a student was short on cash, he would bring a container of spaghetti in and give it to them saying, I know I can't eat all this, please take it home. I knew my father worked with individuals who were developmentally disabled and visually impaired at Sonoma State Developmental Center, but I never really knew he was the first one to do that. He took that first bold step to begin working with these special individuals and provide them with orientation and mobility training. I knew my father worked with preschool children, introducing them to cane travel at the ages of three, four, and five. But I didn't realize he didn't believe, unlike many of his colleagues at the time, that a child had to be of a certain age or a certain specific cognitive ability before they could learn orientation mobility skills. Now children are routinely introduced to these skills at a very young age. I also knew at some point he developed the marshmallow cane tip and sold them to former student and others. I asked him several times over the years, why don't you patent this? He always told me he didn't want to have to go through the process. I never realized he, he didn't patent the cane tip because he didn't want to make any money off of it. He wanted to make sure it was available at every, for everyone at a reasonable price. But one thing I never knew about my father was that he admitted the very first blind visually impaired student into the orientation mobility program at San Francisco State. And I didn't know that he not only admitted the first student in California, but the first student nationwide. I was told by my father's good friend, Phil, the other inductee, that many of my father's colleagues in the field at that time responded negatively to his efforts. Fortunately for so many people, these opinions did not dissuade my father from his beliefs or actions. I don't really know what it was about working with the blind and visually impaired or working in the field of orientation and mobility, but it was not just a job to my father. It was his life's passion. I never knew the professional side of him, but I knew he loved his job. It took him all over the United States, various provinces throughout Canada, and even as far away as Australia. When you lose someone, you think about all the questions you really wish you'd ask them. And something I really wish I had asked my father was, what happened to you while you were at Heinz VA Hospital in Chicago? What was it about working with the blind and visually impaired veterans that impacted your life so much? How was it that something that started out just as a job became a lifelong passion and commitment of service? I don't know the answer to this question, and I know I'll always wonder, probably for the rest of my life, what his answer might have been. Whatever he experienced at Hine changed the world for the better because it changed him, and he changed the world. I don't know all the answers. I know that my father, if he were alive today, he would have been honored and proud of this achievement. In a speech, he would have spent a good deal of time talking about those individuals who came before him, his contemporaries, his mentors, his co-workers, and the contributions they made to the field of blindness. He would have mentioned people like Georgia Lee Abel, Don Blosh, Warren Bledsoe, Everett Butch Hild, Dr. Lowenfeld, 
Sally Mangold, Sally Rogo, Stan Saturko, Russ Williams, and his very, very good friend, Phil Hatlin. He would have talked about how honored he was to have worked with these individuals over the life of his career. He was a man who was passionate about his life's work, but I also think he felt honored to work in the field of orientation and mobility. The adage, you become what you do, is intended as a warning about pursuing things that you don't truly believe in. In my father's case, it was high praise. As I said, he truly loved what he did. On behalf of my family and our many friends, I would like to thank the American Printing House for the Blind for bestowing this great honor on my father. Well, that's a hard act to follow, Christy. I'd like you to think back to the 1950s when O&M services began for veterans of the Korean War. Pete was there. Then in the 1960s, O&M services came to school-aged children. Pete was there. 1966 was a landmark year. The graduate program in O&M opened in San Francisco State University. An O&M credential was created in California and KOMS, California Association of Orientation and Mobility Specialists, was founded in California, and Pete was there. In the 1970s, developmentally delayed students in, in a California mental institution had canes in their hands, and Pete was there. In the 1980s, the marshmallow cane tip entered on the scene and became a part of mainstream O&M services. Pete was there. Burdell Pete Wurzberger was there because he was responsible for instituting all of these first. With the landmarks just mentioned, he was on the cutting edge in developing, promoting, encouraging, and inventing for the field of orientation and mobility. He was a man before his time. Pete was one of the first O&M instructors at Heinz providing services to blinded veterans from the Korean War, although instructors at that time were not called O&M instructors, they were parapatologists. In the late 1950s, he brought this training and his knowledge to the Bay Area where he worked at the Orientation Center for the Blind, or OCB. He saw value in teaching O&M during the summer months to VI resource teachers. He was an innovator when he tread on new territory, new territory by training Bay Area high school students in O&M skills. He expanded this training to San Francisco State University, where in 1966 he opened the graduate level O&M program. This O&M program was the first to include training in serving school-aged children and training with vision simulators during orientation and mobility lessons. In the same year, he supported the creation of a California credential in orientation and mobility and founded KOMS, which he called lovingly chaos. Pete recognized the need and saw potential in establishing O&M training for developmentally delayed students and instituted services at Sonoma State Hospital in Northern California. He worked to help these clients navigate around the campus safely and train their instructors in O&M skills. In working with these students, he observed the need for a new technique and began using constant contact. It was then that he developed the marshmallow tip, which is widely used today by probably 50% of the cane users. He took marshmallow cane tips and made kitty canes for use with preschoolers, realizing that early intervention also indicated a need for orientation and mobility training, training at a young age. This early training was a precursor for the training with canes and mobility devices that most preschoolers receive today. Pete was a pioneer in so many ways. One of the most important and controversial co contributions occurred when Pete admitted the first individual who was blind to the San Francisco State O&M program. The field strongly criticized his judgment in this move. Currently, however, seeing an O&M instructor who is blind is not uncommon, and many individuals who are blind are enrolled in university O&M programs. Pete's email address was Pete Wu at astound net astound.net he did so many things to astound us with his first 
His innovations changed the field forever. He accomplished all of them quietly with little fanfare. My gratitude and that of O&Mers everywhere to the Committee of the Leaders and Legends Hall of Fame for recognizing the innovation and genius of this giant in the field. Pete the man was soft-spoken with a wonderfully engaging smile. He frequently delighted in sharing a joke with friends, colleagues, and students. He was a professional, an innovator, a visionary, and a leader. He was there to institute numerous firsts in the field of orientation and mobility. He's not here with us today, but fittingly, he has earned the incredible honor and recognition of being a leader and legend in the field of blindness and visual impairment. His ideas, innovations, and inventions will continue to lead the field into the future. Thank you to each of our speakers and to everyone here for being a part of the celebration of Phil Hatlin and Pete Wurzberger. We hope that this opportunity will send us each back to our own jobs and to our homes uh, with new incentive to do well because we have that incentive and that motivation through the leaders and legends in our field. This concludes this evening's ceremony. Safe travels to all. Thank you. <laughs>